welcome back to this final segment on metabolic myopathies. With the pieces in place, we can now develop a simplified plan to recognize, diagnose, and identify treatment options for metabolic myopathies. This will serve as a powerful tool for you to utilize in the neuromuscular clinical setting and, of course, in answering course and board examination questions. The common denominator with all metabolic myopathies is an initial complaint of general fatigue and intolerance to physical activity that typically includes pain and muscle cramping. Further questions will provide additional clues to the condition. Pain early on in activity that improves as the activity continues, the so-called second wind phenomenon, as well as pain with high intensity activity is more indicative of a glycogen storage disease. If the pain appears later on in physical activity and intensifies over time, your focus should be more directed towards a fatty acid oxidation myopathy. With both conditions, there is a good chance that the patient will report having experienced cola-colored urine at some point during an attack. With mitochondrial myopathies, the pain is more consistent throughout the activity. The patient is more likely to present with comorbidities, such as myoclonus or seizures, while a history of dark-colored urine is a less common finding. Regardless of the case, the next step in the workup would be forearm exercise testing with pre- and post-blood draws. If a mitochondrial myopathy is suspected, venous blood gases should also be analyzed at this stage. With glycogen storage diseases, the most consistent and indicative finding is a lack of pyruvate increase in the post-exercise blood sample. It's also common to see increases in uric acid in resting blood samples due to increased protein metabolism. Elevated creatine kinase levels may also be noted, which is particularly common with McArdle's disease. With fatty acid oxidation myopathies, we expect an elevated acyl carnitine level in the resting sample that might increase further post-exercise. Post-exercise blood lactate should rise normally and be within normal ranges. Blood lactate should be elevated in both pre- and post-exercise blood draws in mitochondrial myopathies. If blood gases are also analyzed, we would not expect to see the normal drop in venous oxygen levels post-exercise in this patient group. If progressive exercise tests are performed, they should be relatively normal in both glycogen storage disease and fatty acid oxidation disease, although patients with glycogen storage disease are likely to report pain and cramping as exercise intensity increases. Patients with mitochondrial myopathies will terminate the test early at low oxygen consumption levels due to pain and fatigue. Muscle biopsies are not typically ordered but would show characteristic findings such as the presence of ragged red fibers in mitochondrial myopathies. Samples may show accumulations of glycogen or lipid vacuoles in glycogen storage disease and free fatty acid oxidation diseases respectively. In treating all three conditions, diet and physical activity must be carefully monitored and regulated. Individuals with glycogen storage disease should have frequent feeds with closely regulated concentrations of complex carbohydrates. Carbohydrate intake should be further restricted in patients with errors in glycolysis and creatine supplementation should be considered. During activity, the patient should be encouraged to warm up gradually and avoid high intensity exertion to avoid metabolic crisis. Patients with glycogen synthesis or breakdown disorders can also supplement with simple sugars just prior to and in the early phases of activity. For fatty acid oxidation myopathies, diet should focus on greatly restricting fat intake and prolonged fasting should be avoided. Physical activity should be limited in duration or supplemented with frequent carbohydrate feeds to avoid metabolic crisis. Activity is most restricted in the mitochondrial myopathy conditions, and supplementation with certain compounds may assist with metabolic restrictions. That concludes this session on metabolic myopathies. In the next session, we will take a look at another classification of myopathy, which has occasionally been referred to as a heterogeneous group with heterogeneity. 
These are the congenital neuropathies.